uh, I want to tell you about the next webinar coming up and then introduce our guest, Jennifer Carlson. Um, so uh, we have the next, as you know, we have webinars every two weeks and the next one coming up is Andre Dukes, who is, uh, a, uh, is managing the uh, coordination with the community on early childhood programs at Northside Achievement Zone, which is an amazing organization having a, uh, an outsized impact on the entire North Side. Some of the things that they're doing are just nationally, uh, you know, getting recognized. And Andre is a key part of that. Uh, and he's going to give an overview of NAS, as it's called. He's also on our advisory board. Uh, we call those members trusted advisors. I think you'll find that to be a really interesting uh, organization if you're not familiar with it or learn more about it if you are. Um, so uh, and I just uh, want to say if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box as we go, and then we'll accumulate them at the end. Uh, and Jennifer Carlson is uh, a social work unit supervisor in Hennepin County. And I just want to say how much we appreciate Hennepin County making you available. Everybody's so busy. And uh, it's the county that I almost always go to when I need something like this because they're very responsive. And uh, Jennifer is going to uh, tell us about, you know, they basically give us an overview of child protection. Many of us have had it. Uh, before and I mentioned to Jennifer that I've been in this business a long time and I learned something new about how everything works almost every week. So even if you're familiar with it, I think you'll find some useful information here. So with that, uh, I'm going to uh, say thank you, Jennifer, for being here and just take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me today. It's an honor to be here and, and speak with you. Um, so like I said, my name is Jennifer Carlson. I currently supervise a team of eight child protection investigators um, at Hennepin County. Um, because we are such a low, large county, um, we're, we're pretty specialized. Um, I've been in this role for about five years and previous to that, I was a screener with Hennepin County for about a year. Um, and then prior to that, I was at another metro area county for 15 years doing uh, child care licensing and child protection um, as well. So I've been in the, the county government system for about 21 um, years now and about 14 years or so in, in child protection. And I know one of the things you mentioned is you learn something new uh, every week. And I have to say, one of the things that I love about Hennepin is things change frequently. Um, whether it's new programs, um, new uh, protocols, um, always trying to kind of keep up with what is going on in our um, community. So things change here a lot um, as well. So my hope today is to give you kind of an overview of how child protection works. I understand some of you may have some, some really good experience or knowledge already. Um, so hopefully I get to, um, you know, any questions that you, that you might have. And it sounds like we'll have time for questions at the end too, if I don't. So Hennepin County Child Protection um, has a, a, a answer search phones 24 seven to take calls from the community um, about reports of child abuse or neglect. When I started with Hennepin about six years ago, um, intake or screeners answered the phone um, between eight and 4.30 Monday through Friday. And after hours and the weekends, um, Catholic Charities uh, took those calls. Um, so over the last few years that has changed now to where when you call, you are getting a Hennepin County uh, Child Protection Social Worker is answering the phone every time. So we now are answering the phone 24 seven um, and also responding to um, reports, especially more urgent or uh, severe reports in the evenings, overnight, um, and on the weekends. Um, um, there are 29 uh, screening social workers working around the clock um, with COVID. They are now working all um, at home. Um, prior to that, they had an office out in Northeast Minneapolis, uh, kind of like a call center type uh, facility, but right now um, everybody is is working from home. As you can see, I am as well uh, in my dining room. So um, reports get called in, faxed in. We have a form online that people can fill out. Um, so there's many different ways that we get um, reports, but most of our reports come um, with a phone call. Um, they can be uh, teachers, law enforcement, neighbors. Uh, medical personnel, um, anonymous reporters, 
folks don't have to give their names if they don't want to, unless you're a mandated reporter, you, you are required to give your name. Um, so we get reports from um, a vast uh, array of, of folks. Um, one of the other things Hennepin has developed over the last several years, like I mentioned, is what we call our rapid response team. So they're a group of child protection social workers who are available to go out in the evenings, overnights, and weekends, because we all know child abuse doesn't stop at 4.30 on Friday. Um, and historically, those reports would sit there through the weekend and, and until Monday. So um, they're now being responded to the, the most urgent ones or those that require a more immediate response are being um, responded to um, over the weekend. And then what we do is there's a handoff because we have 11 units of investigators. So I supervise one of those 11 units um, who work, you know, Monday through Friday type um, hours. Um, mandated reporters, it sounds like many of you are, you probably all know who you are, um, required to report any suspected abuse or neglect. So it doesn't have to be no, you know, you don't have to confirm it. It just has to be something that you're um, suspecting, either whether it's something you saw, something you heard, um, or something that you um, know about. Um, one of the confusions I think folks have with child protection is that we respond immediately like law enforcement does, does. So when I say we have an immediate response on the evening and the weekends, we're talking, you know, a couple hours after a call is made. So if you see a child in immediate danger, a two-year-old in the street, you're going to go get that two-year-old out of the middle of the street and then you're gonna call 911. You, you don't wanna call child protection first. You've got a child who is in immediate danger, is, is a young child without a caregiver. Um, law enforcement is your, um, is, is your first call. Um, we are required by law to, to cross report to law enforcement. So anytime we get a report, we cross report to them. They're to cross report to us. Um, if they have reports that um, possibly are a child protection type um, um, issues. So um, in theory, if you make a report to law enforcement, that should be coming to us too um, and, and vice versa. We are required to do that cross report. Um, child protection um, jurisdiction is where the child resides while law enforcement jurisdiction is where the incident or the uh, possibly alleged crime occurred. So if I, I'm, I live in Minneapolis, so if I find a two-year-old in the, in the street, um, it's Minneapolis who is gonna investigate that as a, as a possible crime, depending on what the situation is. Um, but if the child's parent lives in New Hope, um, well, it's still Hennepin County. Let's say the child's parent lives in, in uh, uh, Anoka, that's gonna be Anoka County Child Protection's jurisdiction. You don't have to worry about that when you call. We will figure that out. If you call and we determine that the parent lives in another county, um, we have a process where we um, can send those over to that other county. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, but I know sometimes there's some confusion about that. Um, it's most helpful for us if you have as much information about the, the situation as possible with names, if you know dates of birth, addresses, who was present, um, parents, other kin, people who live in the home, um, as much information as you, as you have it is helpful for us. Um, we have access to some systems to, to look people up and try to find them, um, but the more information you have for us, obviously the easier and more quickly that we can identify who, who folks are. Um, we, we do occasionally get reports um, with maybe we have an address, but we don't have a name. Um, Sometimes we might have a neighbor call. Maybe they don't know, you know, necessarily the names of, of the children next door, the parents' names, but they know the address. So um, we we can always work when we have a when we have a address to go out to the home. Um, let's see. So when folks mandated reporters do make verbal reports, we do ask that a, it is follow up follow up by a written report within seventy two hours. Um, Sooner is better than later. 
um, it's difficult for us when we get a verbal report and then we get a written report three days later, maybe there's different or additional information. So the sooner you can send in that written report to us, um, the easier it is for, for us to do our, our piece. I'm gonna skip through some of these because I wanna make sure we have time for questions. Um, one thing just to know, reporters are um, anonymous. Uh, I shouldn't say anonymous. Reporters' information is never shared with the family. So sometimes I, I've done this work, and I know sometimes we'll, you know, families will say to school, hey, you know, school social worker, I know that's you who called, the worker told me that. Um, our staff are well-trained. They know we never share who a report comes from, but you know, if it's educational neglect and the child hasn't been going to school, it's probably a no-brainer that the school is the one who made the report. So, but we never share the information of who the report um, came from. We, when you call into Child Protection, we do try to let you know whether the report is gonna be screened in or screened out. Um, if you're a mandated reporter, you do get a letter at the end of the investigation letting you know the basic outcome of what happened. Um, during that investigation. Skip over. We talked about where reports kind of come from. This graph, and you know what, are you guys able, do I need to close this little, are you guys, I suppose, able to see all this, um, the people on the screen? I wonder if I can, there you go. Um, this graph kind of shows the number of reports over the last uh, 10 years. So you'll see um, when I talked about Hennepin County taking reports 24 seven, you can see an increase in number of reports uh, during that time. That was also on the heels of the governor's task force for child protection, um, where there were some rules changed with how um, reports are screened. Um, gave screeners the ability to look at the history of the family when making their uh, maltreatment determination. Um, and now you can see during COVID, we actually had a significant number of less um, um, reports. So that just kind of gives you the, uh, the vol idea of the volume of the number of, of reports. And again, this is just for Hennepin um, County. Child protection is really um, the agency of last resort. And, and what we mean by that is we really want, we all know what's best for children is for their family, kin, the community, um, other um, uh, maybe religious organizations that may be involved with children to be taking care of children and looking after their best, uh, their well being. Um, but we know when all those things can't happen or don't happen, um, or aren't able to for whatever reason, um, child protection um, is is there to step um, to step in. Um, racial disparities and disproportionalities. I, I don't think it's a secret that we have a disproportionate um, number of children uh, of color in our system. Um, and that starts at the front door. We get a disproportionate amount of reports on families of color. Um, we were looking at our statistics on educational neglect, and more than 90% of the reports we're getting are this year over COVID or on, on families of color. Um, and so that's something we're always keeping in, a, in the backs of our minds when we're working with families um, about how to uh, even that out. Um, but again, it starts with the number of reports that we get um, come in disproportionate um, to what the racial, you know, balance is here in, in Hennepin County. Um, this kind of shows you what some of those disparities are. So on the left side is um, the racial breakdown in Hennepin County, and then on the right shows you um, uh, the race of, of children when they're reported to, to child protection. So you can see for um, African-American children make up 21% of Hennepin County, but 39% of our reports um, involve uh, children who are African-American. For Caucasian kids, 57% in Hennepin County, but only 28% of the reports um, are on uh, children who are 
Caucasian. So some reasons for the disproportionality, this is probably another uh, webinar all in itself. Um, I'm going to flip through some of this. We talked about this a little bit earlier, um, jurisdiction, who has jurisdiction. Again, for child protection, it's the county where the child resides. This just gives you an idea of what kind of reports um, we received. So as you can see, the biggest uh, um, type of report we receive is re um, regarding neglect. That can be educational neglect, um, medical neglect, uh, food, shelter, uh, clothing, that type of neglect. And then the next biggest proportion or next bi biggest portion here is physical abuse followed by um, threatened injury. Threatened injury in encompasses things like um, domestic violence um, where there is some threat of injury to a child. Maybe they're not directly injured, but they witness violence or there's a possible threat where they could have been harmed um, during a domestic uh, situation. 15% uh, sexual abuse and 3.5% mental injury. So that's um, mental injury encompasses reports like um, kids are, I think it's terrorized or some of the verbal um, um, degrading um, to children, things like, um, things like that. Um, I'm going to kind of watch the time here so we make sure we have enough for questions, but we talked a little bit about what neglect might be, um, inadequate food, clothing, shelter, uh, supervision, um, education, um, things like that, uh, hazardous um, materials in the environment that are accessed to small children, things like that. Um, so poverty can look like neglect, um, and it's it's a touchy situation and, and can be um, difficult um, to know what's truly neglect and what's a family who's living in, in poverty and doing the best they can um, with what they have. And this is where we, we hope and, and encourage community and schools to be reaching out to family when, it, when a kiddo has come to school without a winter coat, is that they need a winter coat, um, did they lose it? It's, Sometimes families are moving, things get lost, um, and are there ways that we can rectify that without it being having child protection involved? Um, this chart gives you an idea of how long children can be home alone. Um, so children under the age of eight should never be left alone for any period of time. Um, I think of myself back in the, in the mid 70s and my uh, key around my neck with my yarn in, in kindergarten. <laughs> uh, um, but, the, but these are our kind of our guidelines. This is not a law. Sometimes folks get confused with that. The, the, this is really a guideline, but we will accept reports of any child who is under the age of eight and left home alone for any period um, of time. We also know age, this is talks about chronological age. So we also know children are, are uh, development, developmentally on different tracks. So I, I, I always joke when I do this presentation that, you know, my daughter, I would have been fine to, to have left home um, at a younger age and my son is 19 and I still probably wouldn't leave him home for 24 hours uh, by himself. So um, it's not just about chronological age, it's where the child is developmentally. Do they have access to a phone? Do they know how to reach an adult if there was an emergency? Um, you know, those, those types of things. Um, physical abuse, um, any type of injury that's caused to a child as a result of discipline. Um, whether um, folks agree or not, parents can use physical discipline um, with, with children. We always encourage families to, to look at other uh, ways of disciplining, but it, they can discipline their children. Um, they can use physical discipline. Where, where it crosses the line for child protection is when there are injuries. Um, um, and it also when there are injuries can result in criminal um, charges as, as well. 
Threat and injury you talked about earlier, um, often cases where a child is a witness to domestic violence. So domestic violence, a, a big issue and a concern, especially during COVID when people are have been home together, they're stressed because uh, kids are home from school, they're distance learning, people are maybe been lost, you know, uh, lost their jobs or not working. Um, we certainly have seen an increase in the um, amounts of reports and the seriousness of the domestic violence happening in the, in the home. Mental injury, we talked about that really briefly too. Um, sexual abuse, this one gets a little bit tricky. Um, so sexual abuse would include um, a, anybody who's an offender who, who lives in the home or has a significant relationship. Um, also predatory offenders. So folks who have committed um, either uh, a criminal sexual conduct crime in the past have been charged um, or um, charged with a, a predatory offense such as murder. Um, statute says um, that is something we have to assess in child protection to see whether um, that individual is safe to be around um, um, children. Child to child sexual behavior gets really, really tricky. Um, what we look at is whether is it developmentally um, appropriate? What are the age of the children? Are they similar age? Is there a big age gap? Um, was there force or coercion um, used? Um, but this is an area I, I always suggest if, if you're not sure, you know, give it a give us a call. Um, children under the age of 10 are never listed as offenders in, in our system. We don't want to uh, start to label a, a young child um, um, as a sexual um, uh, predator, but, but certainly law enforcement does take reports um, of kids over, over 10. They're not always um, charged, but, but they can be. Um, we do have some programs to try to help divert that because, again, I, I don't. I think most people would agree we don't want an 11-year-old um, with, with that type of label for, for the rest of their life. Um, so there is some programming through the court system um, to help divert um, um, some of those those cases. Ooh, sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. This is kind of a a, a hot one. Um, in terms of something that we um, um, we don't see a ton, but it's something we're always looking for. Um, not always just young children. We, we had a young mom um, recently who gave birth to a baby in the hospital. We have an older man there with her controlling her phone um, and some other things. And, and really we're suspecting that she's being sex trafficked. So we have some different folks with the BCA that we work with. Um, on these types of cases because they're really, really difficult to, um, um, to prosecute from the, from the legal end of um, things. But it's something that we're always kind of keeping our eyes um, open and watching for. So what happens after you file a report? Um, screeners have 24 hours to make their uh, decision about whether a report is going to be screened in or screened out. Um, it minimally is reviewed with the person taking the call, which is generally a master's level social worker and a supervisor. Um, we've also started the last few years what's called an intake review team, which is a multidisciplinary group that's reviewing reports. It has representation from the county attorney's office. Um, and we're also working to increase representation from different community agencies that was supposed to happen and then COVID hit. So there's been some, some delay in that. So there's a, a team that's reviewing cases that come in um, to make a decision about whether it statutorily meets the requirement for a child protection response. When a report is screened out, so if you call into to child protection screening, they're going to tell you it's either going to be screened or screened out. Screened out just means it didn't legally meet the requirement for a child protection response. Again, we always cross-report to law enforcement, 
it may not be a child protection issue, but it may be a law enforcement issue. Um, when appropriate, we offer voluntary services like our parent support outreach program. Um, we have a, a, a team both internally as, as well as agencies that we contract with. Um, to offer voluntary services to families to help them get connected with community resources or anything else they um, might need to help resolve whatever they have going on. Um, we also do a few, some cases as child welfare, so it's not child protection, um, but a, a child welfare response. We have a couple teams that work with families. One is uh, more of a, what we call parent team conflict. Um, another is um, a child welfare unit that works just with um, victims of sex trafficking and their families. So a screened in report means that it uh, meets that legal definition for a child protection response. And then the decision is made, there's two tracks a report can go down. One is a family assessment and one is a family investigation. For the most part, families probably aren't going to notice any more a difference between those. Um, there was a, a change in how we're doing some interviews. I've been in child protection long enough to see the pendulum swing back and forth. When I started in what, what, 14 years ago, this family assessment response started. And the, the thought was that in a family assessment is more family focused, family friendly. We may have the family all sit down together to talk about what the report is, um, and no uh, determination of maltreatment is made. It, just an assessment for whether services are needed or not. In a family investigation, um, we have to determine did maltreatment happen, yes or no. And if it did, and we make a finding, that can impact families or the alleged offender's uh, background check. So let's say you wanna volunteer at your kid's school. If you have a maltreatment finding on your background, and they go to do a, uh, a background check that could impede your ability to, to volunteer, to work with any type of vulnerable population, uh, with, with adults, with children. And obviously there are cases where we want that to happen, right? We have someone who's sexually abused a child, we don't want them working in a school um, or with other vulnerable populations. Um, so what happens to children? And I, I know one of the questions, that, you know, for this presentation was about foster care. So as you can see, in 2019, only 4.4% of the reports resulted in out-of-home placement. So our goal is always to keep children with families whenever it is safe um, to do so. Um, and when it's not safe to do so, our next best step is to place children out of the home, but with family or with kin. So kin can be someone the, the child has a relationship with. Um, has lived in the home. It could be a relative. Uh, it, it might not be um, because we know children do better with people that they that they know. And then the very last resort is, you know, um, foster care that is not related to the um, to the child. And these are just some of our phone numbers of different, uh, our child protection intake line. Um, anybody can make a referral to the, the Parent Support Outreach Program. Um, child Crisis is uh, a service for um, children that are having um, potentially mental health type issues to kind of assess. Uh, do they need to be seen in the ER? Is there a way to kind of help calm them where they are and do some intervention that way? Um, Project Child works with pregnant moms who are um, using or have had some type of positive um, UA. Be at School is our program that works with kids who are missing school, um, the Domestic Abuse Service Center, and Family Court. So I think I've left 26 minutes for questions. Okay, so we do have some questions coming up. I would invite everybody to, if you're comfortable, to uh, turn your cameras on because we'd love to see everybody. It kind of makes it feel like a nice group. And um, if you have a question, when you have a question, um, I'll, you can just unmute. So what I'm going to do is uh, just field some of the questions that came in from the chat. But before I do that, I'm going to preempt and say, uh, 
can you share this presentation? If you can, we'll put it on the website along with the video. So people will have it because it's just packed full of information uh, that, you know, I think, you know, I will find good as a checklist when I forget something. Yeah, that's something I'll ask. Like I said, I, I kind of stole this from the screening and intake folks. I, I don't think there's any reason you can't, but let me get permission <laughs> for that first. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot to turn on my video. And uh, that would be fine. I would, I would actually want you to do that, to uh, check. <laughs> Jammed up. So uh, I'm gonna take some chat questions that came in in order and please either, you know, at any point you can unmute yourself uh, and ask a question or write it in the chat line. So uh, there's a couple of questions here uh, from uh, Mark Newbin. Uh, you, I don't know if you know Mark, but he's a retired pediatrician. Um, and we wanted to know if Hennepin County Child Protections had high turnover of your staff as some counties have. Yeah, and I wish I had some stats um, with me. I, I don't on um, that. I, I think it kind of ebb, ebb and flows. Um, in investigations, we tend to be fairly um, stable. Um, Hennepin started doing a, a process where we were hiring kind of in big groups and, and having folks trained in what we called an induction unit so that when we had openings, there were staff kind of ready to go to be, um, um, to be placed into those units. Yeah, you know, there's approximately what, 80? Yeah, if there's 11 units with, with eight unit individuals, that's 88 uh, investigators that we have just doing investigations. And I think we, you saw 11 of the rapid response and then the ongoing um, child protection workers who, who work with families more long, um, long term. So I, I don't have a specific you know, number for you in terms of you know, how we are compared to other um, counties. Hennepin has tried to do some things. Um, to retain staff and offering some um, supervision um, to employees. Um, I think the flexible workspace that Hennepin offers is, is attractive to, to many folks, but there are definitely periods of time. Um, I think when COVID started um, and especially in investigations, um, my staff still had to go out and see families. So at the beginning, there were no masks. <laughs> there was little information and there wasn't like, well, you, you guys don't have to go out until we figure this out, right? They still had to go out into people's um, homes and still do. Um, some of the social worker um, areas have some waivers that they can see children virtually. Investigations is not one of them. So my staff continue to be out in the community. And as you can imagine, sometimes families, you know, sometimes families are fine in welcoming us and they have nothing to hide. They want the help. And as you can imagine, other families um, don't really want to let us in the door, let alone have somebody tell them that they need to put a mask on because they don't really want us there to begin with. So um, so I think COVID has been a really strenuous um, time on, on, our, on our staffing, that's for sure. So uh, let me... Um... You know, Mark, skip a couple of your other questions and go to another person for one. And it's from Megan. And mm -hmm. if you do voluntary placements for mental health. Oh, that's good. And I see one of my staff on the, on the, uh, on the webinar here. So, you know, you can feel the free to pipe in too if I get any answers wrong. Um, it, it's tricky because child protection and mental health uh, overlap often. And um, child protection really doesn't want to be doing placement, child protection placements for mental health issues, right? We would rather have families be connected with the mental health system and working um, with that system for placements. Um, um, it, it, gets, it, it gets tricky. Um, if a family isn't willing, you know, to look into that mental health placement, and we have documentation that, you know, this is against the child's best interests or is causing them harm, it certainly can become a child protection issue, but we would rather have families with kids with those extreme mental health issues working with our mental health system. They have lots more resources um, than necessarily, the, you know, doing a placement, but but have we? Yes, but I'd say they're far and few between. 
And then Mark again, do you interview a child privately? I feel like this is a trick question. No, I'm, I'm no, joking. Mark's not a trickster, so you can't. <laughs> I like to use humor because as you can imagine that this is a really tough job um, and so I, I don't ever mean to be disrespectful in, in using humor but I do like to laugh. So when family assessment first came out as the preferred way to um, assess families right because it was the thought was this is more family friendly. Um, children were interviewed sometimes maybe in a group with, the, with their parents present. Now remember these are lower level um, type cases, um, you know, due to lots of different things, children are now always interviewed separate from their, um, from their parents or the alleged offender or someone who has a relationship with that. So if it's mom's boyfriend, who's our alleged offender, mom has a relationship with him, we would not interview that child in front of mom um, or that alleged offender. So we always prefer to interview kids at school. Why? They're alone, um, with their parents haven't had a chance to coach them. Um, school is generally a safe place for children, but obviously with COVID being shut down or COVID shutting down schools, um, that's kind of forced us to see kids at home. And then we, we do the best we can, right? We, we um, can ask to see children meet with them privately. Sometimes really young children don't want to be separated from their parent. And so if we have a kid crying because they're scared, right, there's a stranger now coming home. And even though my staff have excellent skills in engaging children, um, sometimes there isn't a way to around that or a child who just isn't developmentally um, at a place. It, 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 some of your children with more severe autism. Because um, sometimes even when we go to school, school staff will ask, hey, can we sit in on the interview? And if we need that school staff to help us keep the child regulated, we may see us, but usually we don't want other people in the room because then the children look to those adults for cues about how should they're answering, right? Am I giving you the answer that they want? Because most children want to, you know, to please or to do the right thing. So, so that's the long answer um, to your short question, which is yes, we do interview children privately when at all possible. Um, with, with very few exceptions. And if we don't, we're documenting why there's data being collected on that as to what kind of circumstances that are where we're not able to interview um, a child away from the alleged offender or somebody who has a relationship with them. Mark, if I can, and Jennifer, I can, I can add a little bit of context to that as well. Uh, as part of the governor's uh, child protection task force, one of the recommendations was to end the practice of interviewing children in front of the adults for that initial child protection interview. And counties generally said, no, we're going to keep doing these whole family interviews. Uh, it's one of the things that has come up time and again in research, which basically has said that this is, you know, high risk uh, and shouldn't be done. Uh, but counties uh, continue to assist on it. Uh, and what happened was in 2019, there was a settlement of a class action loss in which the county was required to end this practice. But it's not statewide. Uh, yet. Um, so we're grateful for that happening in, um, in Hennepin County at any rate. And <clears throat> while I'm at it, let me maybe fill in a little bit about the turnover question too. I don't know where it is now, but right uh, during that class action lawsuit and, and you know, right after the governor's task force in 2015, there was, uh, the, the turnover was really high in Hennepin County. I think it was uh, 80 to 100 percent a year. And Hennepin kind of moved heaven and earth to, to try to address that and uh, brought in new training, increased the number of workers of color. They you know, beefed up the, the um, you know, the, the, quant the amount of the training and so forth and provided more support from supervisors. And I remember going to a conference where I talked to a number of uh, workers from other counties who said they were applying to Hennepin because, you know, the, the atmosphere, the, you know, just the culture hit had improved so much at that point <clears throat> that they, they kind of wanted to go there. And it was like a complete uh, turnaround of a difficult situation in less than two years. Now, I don't know if that's continued, but I just think, uh, you know, I've been in government a long time and I've been mostly involved in turnaround situations like this. And I think that it was just a, a really incredible job that the county did on that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, 
just when I'll give credit. Now, hopefully that's continued. I haven't really looked at it for at least a couple of years, but um, so um, Mark, I'm gonna uh, skip you for a second and go to another question uh, from someone else. Um, let's see, what's the difference between emotional abuse and psychological abuse and mental injury as per the statute? This is from Mervat. Oh, I'd have to pull out my, you know, 100 page screening guidelines here. Um, we don't get a ton of reports in this um, area. I can look up for you and see exactly what the language is. So there's some very specific language. Um, all right. So it's all under mental injury. So mental injury and emotional harm refer to a substantial and observable injury to a child's psychological capacity or emotional stability that is either inflicted or caused by a neglectful behavior on the part of the person responsible for that child's care. It's demonstrated by a substantial and observable effect on the child's behavior, emotional response, and cognition not within the normal range for a child stage of development and in regards to their culture. So here, here are some examples that our screening guidelines give. A child showing extreme regressive behavior or psychosomatic symptoms related to a high conflict custody situations and parent-child attachment concerns. Um, Signs a child is exhibiting symptoms similar to post-traumatic stress disorder, such as hyperarousal, disassociation, re-experiencing, avoidance, no effect, self-harm, extreme aggression, um, those kind of things. So it refer and then it kind of lists out some of the behaviors, rejecting or parental behaviors, rejecting, isolating, terrorizing, corrupting. Um, and this can be find, uh, found on DHS's website if you want. It's like I said, a hundred page guideline, Minnesota Child Maltreatment Intake Screening and Re Response Path Guidelines if you wanna, if you want your own copy for reference. I'm gonna, you know, kind of butt in with a question here. You said that families won't really notice the difference if they go on the family assessment versus investigation track as much. But you know, this was probably the biggest single set of issues in the governor's task force, which I haven't mentioned I was a, a part of. And um, there were a number of family assessment um, practices that were recommended to be changed. And the state and the, the counties basically said, no, we're not gonna change them. Uh, and they are very distinct in terms of how it would the look and feel of it from the point of a parent. As you said, uh, more family friendly, which we you know believe is really means adult friendly because there's not, you know, fact-finding process to see if the child is okay. There's, you're interviewing the child in front of the adults, which I understand has changed now. Um, my understanding is there's not, uh, whatever the finding was, even if there's not a formal assessment, it's not put into the case record. So if the case comes back in down the road, um, the, you know, the next worker doesn't have that history. So there were practices and, and then giving advance notice to the child protection workers coming. So there's opportunities to you know, uh, coach and intimidate children, you know, put ice packs on the bruises or whatever. So those are things that would be, you know, very different from traditional investigation, which I would think a family would know. So if it isn't, if families don't notice the difference, I'm wondering if some of those practices maybe have changed while we were not aware. Well, yeah, so, so it has. So, so the, whole mo the whole family assessment model is very, you know, in essence has been scrapped, right? Because that, and I think what is tricky, while I agree, and we know the research says children should be interviewed in front, we're lumping all child protection reports together. So the 15 year old who has a scratch on their hand because the parent was trying to take their cell phone away from them is treated then the exact same way as a parent who has, you know, shaken a baby and there are multiple broken bones. And we all know those are two very, very different types of report. So, so now we have, you know, one type of response for all types of, of, of cases. And um, so I think with everything, there are pros and cons um, to how those things are, the being able to look at history. Certainly the, the pro to that is in, in looking at history and, and taking that into consideration. 
um, about whether reports are screened. The pro of that is right, hey, this is our eighth report about this, you know, from different people. Um, you know, maybe we this does need to be screened in this time or what, what is really going on. But we also know our families of color are reported disproportionately um, than our, our non-families of, of our, than our white families. So we also have that, that bias coming in as, um, as well. And I, I don't have the answers to, to any of this or, you know, I'd probably be uh, at a much higher, higher level. So there's certainly pros and cons. So yes, in terms of has there a change? Yes, we, because of the settlement agreement, we are required to interview children separately. And if we can't or, or the child won't, or there's an extenuating circumstance, again, I think we're out there because the kid's got a scratch on their, on their hand. Um, um, we have to document very specifically as to why um, we um, didn't see the child separately. So, but what about some of the others, like uh, going through a fact-finding process? You know, that the practice was, we're here from child protection. We're not here to ask questions. We're just here to offer services. So that was some testimony that we heard in the in the task force. Yeah, uh, if that's still the case, and I suspect Hennepin may be different from the rest of the state as well. Yeah, well, I could tell you. So that other metro area county that I worked in for for. Uh, 15 years before I came to Hennepin. I, I mean, we were still on it. I think there's a misnomer, and, and maybe if you heard differently from some folks, maybe different counties practiced it d differently, is there was never that we, we didn't have to just figure out who, did, right? It's a family assessment. So finding out did, did, did mom cause that scratch on the hand or did she not really wasn't, um, hmm. How do I want to say that? I think it's a misnomer to say that in family assessment there wasn't some fact finding because you still have to address what the what the issue is. But it sounds like maybe in whatever they, you know, some folks were saying that wasn't wasn't happening. But yes, yeah, so all in all investigations, family assessment. Now most families wouldn't be able to tell you um, unless the worker is explaining to him this is a family assessment. There isn't a determination at the end versus. You know, this is an investigation. Their letter definitely tells them at the end if there's a finding or not because they have an opportunity to appeal that decision. Greg, you were in your, your uh, predecessor. Go ahead, Greg. Daisy, focus just a little bit because um, I know this commonly comes up when we talk about child protection, both in the media and in public perception. Um, it's often stated that your know, child protection removed this child. And then, you know, child protection, you know, is responsible for the child being in out of home placement. Um, could you specifically address the legal authority issue regarding the placement and what authority or basically what authority child protection does not have pertaining to out of home placement? Great question, Greg. Thank you for bringing that up. So, yeah, so that is a misnomer that child protection removes children from the home. So we basically have zero authority to do that. So there's two ways children are, are removed from the home. One is on a 72 hour health and welfare hold, which has to be signed by law enforcement. So let's say that two year old I reference is outside in the street, we can't find a parent, uh, uh, an officer would have to place that child on, on, a, on a hold. Um, um, even in a child in a hospital, um, uh, law enforcement agency has to has to sign that hold. The other way a child is removed from the home is the department petitions the court to say, we believe these are child children in need of protection of, and services, and we are requesting or recommending there be an out of home um, placement. So a judge reviews it and can sign what's called an order for immediate custody. In both of those cases, both the police hold and the order for immediate custody, a hearing has to happen within 72 hours and a judge reviews that information and makes a decision. Sometimes the department or child protection doesn't want children returned, <laughs> but a judge overrules and decides that a child, child is going to go home. Um, same thing with police holds. Um, we will make our case to the court um, and ultimately the judge is the one who has the final decision about whether those children remain in out-of-home placement or not. 
and I think I think maybe we have some guardians on the um, on the team too. Obviously, um, children when um, are at court, they they're guardian ad litems. Children over the age of ten get their own attorneys. Parents have attorneys, so all these different people are making recommendations about what will happen. But the judge ultimately is the final decision maker about whether children remain in out of home placement or not. So sometimes we get kind of a bad rap that children were returned home when it wasn't, you know, maybe wasn't the recommendation of the department. Um, but that's how that that process works. May I ask a follow up question, please? Yeah, go ahead. Can you turn on your camera? Yeah, sure. Remember that? I was just getting to you, but you go ahead yourself. <laughs> So a question here. Um, you stated the statute for um, mental injury perfectly fine. Um, the question here. Um, first of all, um, substantial. In in order to substantiate a persistent change, you need to to know the baseline of this child, which uh, often. Um, it, you have to have the history of this child, which is um, th that's something. I mean, I see it um, is not happening in this uh, psycho uh, mental injury case. Um, second of all, um, who um, it's hard to determine who it, uh, did that injury, especially if it's mental injury, placed that mental injury in a child. The main question for me, this is just an introduction. For example, it's a case of child sexual abuse. So the child has been coached to deny, recant, and threaten to deny the sexual abuse happened to him. So you accuse the parent for coaching for mental injury for threatening to rec to um, um, to coach the child to not, not, abuse not happening. In a child exhibit post traumatic stress disorder from the threat in the sexual abuse itself. And um, per se, this is your view as a county, you got it wrong. The judge tells you, hey, you got it wrong, and the ch this child has sexual abuse. As a county, what steps you can do, what services you can provide for this specific child? Would you let go? Uh, yeah, we don't still believe, we don't agree with this judge uh, point of view. We still believe that this child coached and didn't sexual abuse, even though the the judge, after show, uh, sees the evidence, saying, you, hey, I believe this child got likely sexual abuse. You didn't listen to them. You didn't provide the safe environment to, to facilitate the coach. You didn't interview collateral and you didn't listen to psychologists. Do you still stand in your own belief as a county? Hey, we didn't get it wrong. We just uh, failed to protect this child because that's the point of view of the judge. And you just let go? Or we take steps to, because nobody's perfect. Uh, county mistakes is happen, but uh, will, would you admit that, yeah, go over your own bride, not, I'm not talking about you as yourself as a county or a, a facility itself. And okay, let's say it from the other view and, and do something for this child. So I think it would be, you know, difficult to answer that without knowing the specifics, but I guess the general question is if the court disagrees with you and says, no, you made a mistake, do you have the ability to ignore the court? Well, I guess there's two separate things here is what, no, we, we, we don't trump a judge. I mean, if judge makes a decision about children being returning home, I, I, I mean, we have attorneys that represent us and, and, and um, so I, I, I don't, I can't think of any process, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, that would, but, but I'm thinking your question really is about child sexual abuse. So we use corner house when we can, when it's appropriate to, to interview children. So families are offered services there. There are folks that follow up with um, um, families. So even if a child doesn't disclose, they're still offered services. Um, 
you know, if a child is being coached by someone and, and told not to tell, I, I mean, I've, I can think of one case where I've had where the, a report was made, the child denied, but it was, I think her, the brother was the offender and he admitted, he admitted like that almost never happens, but, you know, fast up. So even though she said it didn't happen, um, he, he admitted that he did. And, and so, so it's tricky. I don't know a situation where we'd be in front of a, a, a judge on, on that. If a, if a child's denying sexual abuse, what's tricky with sex abuse is kids have to be ready to, to talk about it. And we do have to have some information, um, uh, about it. Um, I like to think these kind of cases, you know, are often uh, our law enforcement partners are working with us. These are the most common kind of cases that potentially have criminal charges. Um, so we work very closely with law enforcement to make sure that we get um, good interviews from um, alleged victims and any collaterals. Um, and, and sometimes kids aren't ready to d disclose. And um, we also have to be careful about how many times we interview children at Corner House, um, because when children are uh, interviewed repeatedly and repeatedly, we, we also know that's problematic um, as well. So I, I don't know that I'm answering your question, um, but do we ever admit that we get it wrong? Yeah, I mean, we do the best we can with the information that we have um, and working at the, the volume that we work at. Um, so when I get, you know, wake up in the morning and I have eight cases to assign and I only have six people, right? My people have to, we can't control how many reports come in. So we, what I have to tell my staff is you have to figure out what deserves the most, you know, attention at this, you know, period of time, because we can't control the number of reports that come in, right? We have no, they have to be done with our statutory requirements about how uh, soon children are seen, how, how long we have to do our um, um, investigations or assessments. Um, so we, we always do the very best that we can with what we have. But this, it's also a whole system, right? It's not just child protection. We have law enforcement. We have our, our um, criminal system, too. We have our collaterals that we work with. So You just mentioned that children, so children, sexual abuse, you don't really like to label a child with a uh, sex predator. And, 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 and that is a general view that I just uh, discovered lately. And I appreciate that using the corner house is a great facility. I, I have mm -hmm. a direct contact with, with them. I worked with them. Um, and uh, they do a tremendous job. However, the, the answer, the, the question, uh, I appreciate that you answer that you do admit that sometimes uh, you do it wrong or rarely, but would you take an action or you just let go? Well, what, when you say we did it wrong, what, what I, I mean, we, 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 so we need a preponderance of evidence to make a maltreatment finding. So that's 51%. We have to be, you know, 51% certain that maltreatment happened or, or it, it, it didn't happen. And so when you say we did it wrong, I, I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, let me be clear. Uh, per se, I give you an example. I'm a physician. I uh, label a bottle a misdiagnosis for one of my patients, for example. So I discovered by the lab work that I got it wrong. And I, I, I give the wrong medication. Uh, my duty and my ethical practice um, compel me to just uh, not only admit my mistake, but fix it, give the correct treatment. The way I see it in child protection, it's uh, uh, different. Well, I appreciate that you admit when you figure out that you did wrong, you admit it, that, that's great. However, because you just said, um, you just feel like the judge just disagree with your point of view, but the just having said that, it does not convince you. And it, it, in a, in another word, it doesn't redirect your. You're still going right. Uh, you're you're not based on the judge so direction. I, I think not we, uh, you know, I think it's a kind of an impossible question to to answer in the abstract, and we. We are kind of out of time, but I, I think there's still a couple questions and comments. So 
Maybe we can go another few minutes, but I don't want to keep people too much over. And I don't know whether, Jennifer, you, you can do that. But um, I think the, uh, you know, Greg, you were going to make a comment. I think there's one more from, from Mark we can try to get in. So uh, oh, if, if Jennifer doesn't mind my chiming in on this topic real quickly. Please um, do. And I'm trying to make this real quick. A lot of times in my experience, especially in some of the sex abuse cases and the mental health and you know psychological harm cases, a child may not be able to or ready to disclose at a certain point in time, or there may be influences from one parent versus the other parent, coaching, non-coaching, whatever. And what may be more important than getting it right or wrong is getting the child the help that they need. And sometimes that help is ongoing mental health or counseling services and a qualified therapist over time can help the child sort out what's going on. And maybe at one point in time in consultation with the county attorney's office, child protection will decide we don't have enough to move forward but after a child has been in therapy for several months and the therapist recontacts us and says, I've got a better handle on where the child is coming from and we can now maybe move forward with more solid documentation or support from the therapist to the child to have a more effective intervention from child protection. So a lot of times it's a matter of getting the child plugged into the proper services is all I'm saying right, versus because, getting it right or wrong in child protection or the court system. It's getting the yeah. child into the right mental health system to get the therapy they need. Yeah, because when you think about adult survivors of uh, sexual abuse from priests, they typically mm. if disclose it all in their 40s and 50s. So it's, you know, it's not going to necessarily come out. Let me just, uh, one more question, real, if we can answer this briefly, because we're holding people over here, especially Jennifer. And um, it's Mark was saying that if you hand materials or give uh, written materials to parents, do you kind of check and ask about their literacy skills and so that you know that they are able to use the material? That's a great that's a great question. Um, really the only, and, invest, and I can only really speak from investigations because that's my wheelhouse, right? I, I think a lot of people think you know, ongoing, there's ongoing child protection that works with families, you know, more long-term. In child protection investigations, the main thing we're giving to families in writing is their data privacy and their tennis and notice, right? This is what your rights are. Um, they don't have to talk to us. They have to, we have to let them know that we do share information with law enforcement and do have to make reports <laughs> to other agencies. So the question is, do we, um, do we assess their literacy? My staff, certainly if folks can't read or they think they don't, they, they try to explain those forms to them um, um, so that they understand what they are. When they sign it, they're just acknowledging they uh, um, that they've received it, they're not a, they're not signing that they they agree to anything. I'm I'm not sure an ongoing Greg. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that in terms of how they assess literacy with with parents or written um, you know written material. I know many of the materials that we have are written at at the typical sixth grade level to ensure you know the greatest audience you know or folks being able to read what we have, including. We have a lot of things in different languages to accommodate the very, you know, vast, you know, variety of languages that are spoken in our county because we want families and when at all possible, we try to use workers who speak the same language. I have a, a worker in my unit who speaks Spanish. So she got two cases today because uh, I had two Spanish speaking families and we know for families, it's best for them if they can speak in their native language and not have to go through an interpreter uh, you know, when they, um, when we're able to. So, okay, I think we need to wrap it up. We've run over by a fair amount here, but um, that's because we have so many interest and so many questions and I appreciate your fielding them all. And um, I have many more myself, but we're... <laughs> so I thank you all for, for showing up. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Jennifer. And again, in two weeks, 
Andre Dukes from uh, Northside Achievement Zone, and we hope to see you all then. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Jennifer, nice meeting you. Nice to meet you too, Greg. After uh, after all, I've 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 heard about the the Gregs that uh, you know preceded me. It's great to put a, a face to a name, and thanks for uh, helping me out and putting your perspective out there. And no problem. Good <laughs> luck. Somebody named Jen said you did a great job, and she had to go to a meeting. So oh, so all right. Well, um, later, Rich. Later. Talk to you soon. All right. Thanks. See you, everybody.